So this is what this class is, RCIA, Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults. So write the right or how we go about teaching the faith, catechizing, teaching the faith to those who are coming into the Catholic Church. This is the way that the church lays out that we are to bring someone in to the faith. It's not as easy as some churches you might be used to going into where it's just, oh, I just fill out the little card in the pew and turn it in, and I'm a member. <laughs> because we are preparing you to receive other rites. The rite of baptism. The rite of First Holy Communion, which also includes the rite of reconciliation. And the rite of confirmation. So this is what we call coming into full communion with the church, into full union with the Catholic faith. So baptism, of course, is the very first, and we call these rites as far as what we do or how we do them, but they are sacraments. Sacraments, that's the same root word that we have for sacred, and it means holy. It comes from the Latin sanctus and the Latin word sacramentum in Greek. And we're going to be talking a little bit about Latin and Greek in here, just sort of terms and where words come from, sort of the derivation of words. In Greek, it was mysterion or mystery. These are the mysteries of the faith. These are the sacraments of the faith. Okay, so baptism is what begins our faith life. It is being born again of water and the spirit, as Jesus tells Nicodemus in the Gospels, right? We are born once in the physical sense, born into the natural world, but we have to also be born in a spiritual sense into the supernatural world. And that is what baptism is. Baptism comes from the word baptizoi, which means washing. And that's in a physical sense what is taking place, even if it is in a ritualized way or the way that the rite is conducted, the ritual, there is a pouring of water. So there is a physical sense of washing but it is on a deeper spiritual reality, the cleansing of our souls from sin, right? Washing away original sin. And we'll get into that when we talk about the covenants and Adam and Eve and the concept of original sin, but also washing away any personal sin. If we are older and have that self-responsibility for sins that we have committed. And sin is simply any time we don't follow the will of God, when we go against the will of God. And we can talk about the two kinds of sin, sins of commission, when we commit a sin, when we do something wrong. But there are also sins of omission, when we fail to do what is right, when we fail to do what is good. We omit the things that we are supposed to be doing. But baptism washes us clean of our sin. So it is a washing, it is a cleansing of our soul. Not just of the outside of the body, but of the inside. And you may remember Jesus often was on the Pharisees about this. He said, you wash the outside of the cup, right, or the dish, but the inside is filthy. Or you whitewash the outside of the tomb, but inside you are like the rotting bones. Okay? So it said it's not just important for us to be clean on the outside. We kind of understand that in a natural way, 
right? We understand when we get dirty, when we are smelly, when we, we need to wash to clean ourselves, but we forget that there's also on the inside, in our hearts, in our souls, when we commit sin, right? That also makes us dirty in the eyes of God. That makes us in need of being washed clean, of being purified, okay? First Holy Communion, or the Eucharist, is the way that we participate in the new covenant of Christ, when he established the new covenant at the Last Supper, right? So communion is a common union. Holy communion is a common union with the holy, with God. This is the way that he draws us in union with him, through the new covenant that is made by Christ. Eucharist, it's also called, comes from the word Eucharistia, which means thanksgiving or to give thanks. This is the way that we give thanks to God. We thank God for bringing us into union with him, right? But we have to be prepared for that union. We have to be prepared to be united with God who is holy and so we cannot be full of sin. That's why baptism is required before communion. And if we have fallen back into sin after baptism, if we have fallen back into our ways of being disobedient to God's will, that's what the rite of reconciliation is for. It reconciles us to God and to one another as a community of faith, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And then confirmation is the completion of baptism because often baptism happens with infants. And it is not the infant, it's not the baby who is choosing to come into this relationship with God. But after the age of reason, there is a confirmation. There is a confirming that yes, this is not just the faith that my parents want me to have, but I want to take responsibility for my faith. I want to live out this relationship with God. So I am confirming that. So that's what confirmation does. And in confirmation, we receive through the anointing of chrism, one of the holy oils, the gifts of the Holy Spirit to help us in that relationship in a special way. So we receive that, that, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We receive that presence of the Holy Spirit in our life to help us to choose to do the good to choose to be obedient to the will of God, right? If we listen to that voice, if we listen to God trying to guide us, the Holy Spirit is there to help us to do the good things that God wants us to do. All right, so those are the basic sacraments, okay, of initiation, right? These are what we call the sacraments of initiation. Uh, baptism, First Holy Communion, confirmation. Now, reconciliation kind of goes along with that after our baptism to restore us to that baptismal grace, that purity that we receive at baptism. But the sacraments of initiation, baptism, communion, confirmation. These are how we are initiated into the church, all right? And so that's why the RCIA is preparing us, right? The rite of Christian initiation. It is preparing us for these sacraments of initiation. And this is the way that we do it with adults who are coming to the faith, all right? As opposed to the regular course of catechesis and study that we would have for a child who is baptized who sort of receives these sacraments naturally as they grow up. So that's done through our catechetical program. But this is just sort of the preparing us to come into the church if we are coming later in life to this relationship with God through the Catholic Church. And it makes sure that we are prepared and that we understand what we are doing because we don't want someone just to fill out a card and say, oh, now I'm a Catholic. We want you to say, 
you are entering into a special relationship with God. You are entering into this covenant relationship that Jesus has established. And you need to be prepared and aware and ready to make that decision. And so that's what this time of learning and instruction is about, so that you can make that informed decision. Okay? All right. Questions? So where do we begin then? If we want to look at developing a relationship with God, maybe the first question that we should ask is, does God exist? If we want this relationship, and many of you who are here would probably say, well, I already believe that. I already believe God exists. I mean, that's why I'm here. But it's good to sort of look at why do we believe that. We don't just take that as a given, but we have a reasonable and rational explanation of why we believe God exists. So that's the kind of the first question that we'll look at. And I use those two terms there, like reasonable and rational. There is a sort of thought, especially in today's world, although it's not new, that faith is one thing, right? And reason is another. And never the two should cross, right? That there is scientific knowledge and there's, you know, mathematical knowledge and all of this over here that is reason, reasonable, and faith is just faith. It's just blind faith. And you just have to believe because someone said so. But that's not what the Catholic Church teaches, and that's not what the Catholic Church believes. Faith and reason work together. And we should have a reasonable faith, right? St. Paul says, always be prepared to give a reasoned defense of your faith. And that's why we'll be talking some about Greek terms and Latin terms, especially the Greek terms from reason or philosophy. Okay? Philosophy is a Greek word, okay, that literally means Love of wisdom, philosophia, love of wisdom. Anybody think of any great ancient philosophers? Socrates. All right. And then you said Aristotle, and there was somebody in between them. Yes. And those are the three that we're really going to kind of look at a little bit when we talk about reason, when we talk about philosophy. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Do you know about what time in history these philosophers were teaching? In ancient Greece, in Athens? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> around 400 BC, 400 years before the birth of Christ. <laughs> around 400 BC in ancient Greece and Athens. This is Socrates, who was the teacher of Plato, and Plato, who was the teacher of Aristotle. And Aristotle was the teacher of another great person in history that was not a philosopher so much as applying what he had learned from Aristotle philosophically to carrying out his conquest of the known world. Anybody know who that was? Alexander the Great, 
Have you heard of Alexander? <laughs> so, and we'll look at that when we look at history, because we're kind of going to put things in a historical context, too, as far as what was going on, okay? So, these great philosophers looked at the questions of life and what is life and, and how are we to live our life and what are our relationships to each other, what are our relationships to the state or to the government, right? Because Athens was the center of democracy and what would be the best possible form of government and what Socrates had come up with and what Plato, we don't really have any writings from Socrates himself, but we have Plato telling us what Socrates taught and how he taught. It's what we call the Socratic method, kind of a method of questions and answers and kind of going through and exploring and drawing out. And I hope that we kind of conduct the class for RCIA this year in that kind of method, that you feel confident enough to be able to ask questions and to explore questions. And I'll, I'll kind of be asking you things and kind of getting you to think and bring forth answers. And even if, you know, you say, well, I don't know what the right answer is. Well, it's okay because we'll begin where you do answer and sort of be led toward where we want to go. Okay, so that's kind of the Socratic method. But Socrates said the best kind of ruler in a philosophical sense would be the philosopher king. One that is not concerned with himself one that is not concerned with self-gain or self-power, but really thinks about what is best for the subjects, what is best for people, how people can best reach their own goals, their own achievements. And he said, one way of doing that is to remove children from their parents and have all children raised by the state because then there's no bias. Well, this is my child, or this is my family member. There's no nepotism, right? So everybody is just concerned with what is really best for everybody. Now, he posited that, okay? But Plato himself wrote what is called the Republic, <laughs> and he said the Republic is really the best form of government. There's this ideal of the philosopher king, and that works great if you can kind of remove all of the other things of the world, all of the distractions of the world. But in a more concrete way, he said, it is better to have a republic, a republic in which there is a voice for the people and that there is not just one ruler who says, this is the way that everything has to be. And so <laughs> there is these this you know great questions of relationship with each other and relationship with government or relationship with a ruler that sort of then we can look at well how was what they were coming up with reasonably rationally from philosophy applicable to what we see in our faith and there's another kind of question that they asked because they did ask, you know, does God exist? Is there a God? Anybody know how Socrates died? Yeah, he was forced to drink hemlock. Do you know why he was forced to drink hemlock? He was charged with corruption of the youth. Okay, corruption of the youth. Those he was teaching, like Plato. <laughs> right? Because he taught monotheism. And what was Greece? It was polytheistic, right? We know some of the Greek gods like Athens is the city named after the goddess Athena, right? So they were polytheistic. They ascribed the attributes of the natural world like the sun rising and setting to Apollo, okay? They ascribe wisdom, okay, to Athena. So there was this taking the attributes of the physical world and putting them, or what we call anthropomorphizing, right? 
putting things of the world or human things, including human emotions like anger, lust, greed, revenge. These were the types of gods, all right, or the characteristics of the gods. The gods would often be angry with the people, right? You would have to make sacrifices to appease the gods. But Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they all asked in, in one way or another this, this question, does God exist? And they all came to the same answer. Well, if God exists, there are not many gods. There can only be one God, monotheism. And it was for teaching monotheism that Socrates was charged with corrupting the youth and sentenced to death by drinking hemlock. Okay, so out of a polytheistic society comes this philosophy, right, of monotheism, this philosophical idea that there really is only one God. Okay, mono means one, theism comes from theos, which is God, right, one God. So, Greece itself was polytheistic. Poly means many, okay? Believed in many gods. So, we already see from reason, it can be reasoned that there is one God, okay? Well, what are some of the attributes that they came up with for this one God? that God, if there is a God, he must be all-powerful, okay? All-powerful. Or omnipotent or omnipotent, okay? He must be all-knowing. or omniscient. And he must be all present. All right? Omnipresent. They had another way of saying this. Okay. If God exists, then God has being. But God doesn't just have a being if God is God. God is being itself. Okay. Now, does our faith have anything, when you think of anything in the Bible that kind of parallels this? What, is, what does God say to Moses when Moses says, who are you? All right. I am who am. Okay. Yahweh. Hebrew doesn't have vowels, so just consonants that we translate. But we, but the word that we may know is Yahweh. I am who am. Or I am being itself. I am life itself. I am existence itself. Everything that has existence has existence because of God. God is not just something that exists. God is existence itself. So when we say, does God exist? We say, yes. We know by faith, right? We're here because we take that on faith. But we can also come to that knowledge by reason. Okay? It is reasonable to believe that God exists because we see existence. We see life. And there must be a source for that life. Okay, Aristotle would be taken up by another famous uh, 
priest who was a philosopher in his own right and would sort of look at Aristotle's writings and bring together what we would call all of theology, the, theo the Summa Theologia, and that is St. Thomas Aquinas, okay? And he would take the five ways of being and the existence of being from Aristotle and use it as the proofs for God's being, for the existence of God. And one of those is the infinite regression. You say, well, I come from my mother and father, and they came from their mother and father, and you can keep going back, but you can't go back infinitely, right? At some point, there is a source. At some point, there is a beginning. You can keep going back and saying, even if we go back and say we get back to an amoeba, right? And a string of proteins, right? And you go back to the primordial soup and you say, well, but what existed before that? Keep going back. Well, we get all the way back to what Father Lemaistre, who was a contemporary of Einstein, would coin as the Big Bang. Okay? Have you heard of the Big Bang Theory? Maybe you've seen the TV show, right? But that actually was uh, the theory of a Catholic priest who was working in conjunction or around the same time as Einstein. And it is that there is a beginning to the universe. Okay? Now that goes farther than what Aristotle would say. Aristotle sort of believed in this study state universe. Well, things had always been. But there is this infinite regression. You say you've got to get back to some source, some beginning, something that puts something in motion. That's another one of the arguments, the arguments from motion. Okay? Right? Something puts something else into motion and something put that into motion. And you go all the way back until you get to what is called the the unmoved mover, okay? The one who moves but is not moved by anything else. The one who initiates all movement of the celestial bodies, of the heavens, okay, of everything who puts everything into existence, brings everything into existence. And Aristotle, you know, wrote about all this, but Thomas Aquinas would take that, would put it in the terms of the faith, and he would say this unmoved mover is what we would call God. The philosophers didn't come to an understanding of God that we have through faith. Okay? Because faith is also about revelation. How God reveals himself to humanity. So while reason can tell us that God exists and that it's reasonable to believe that there must be one God, monotheism, and that God must have these kind of attributes, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, it can tell us a lot about God, but it can't tell us who God is. Okay, Reason can't tell us the who. So, reason can tell us about God, or that God exists, okay? But God reveals to us through faith. Who he is, who is God. Does that make sense? Okay. So God reveals himself to Moses, and he does say, I am who I am, right? But what else does he say? I 
am the God of Jacob, right, of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Okay? All of a sudden, there's not just I am being itself, I am existence itself, I am the unmoved mover, but I am the God that entered into relationship, right, that revealed myself to Abraham and to Jacob and to Isaac. Okay, who enters into history, who enters into the human experience, who wants a relationship with humanity. Okay, this tells us much more about who God is. And how does Jesus reveal God? Right? When you pray, pray like this. What? Our... Father. <laughs> Jesus reveals God as Father. All right? And of course, reveals himself as the Son. And of course, promises to send the Holy Spirit. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We say, wait a minute, we're monotheistic. What do you mean, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Okay, well, we're going to talk about that when we talk about the Trinity. Okay? <laughs> so, what do we mean? How can we be monotheistic, and yet, when we pray, we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit? How does that work? Well, we have to understand the triune God. We have to understand the Trinity. Okay? Questions about this? <laughs> yeah. But we have to understand there is a reason for our faith. It is reasonable to be monotheistic. It is reasonable to believe in God, right? In a creator of the universe. How do we say it? In the creed, right? I believe in God, the Father, right? Almighty, who created heaven and earth, all things visible, the physical world, right, and invisible, the spiritual world. Our faith helps us to realize that there is more than just what reason can tell us. Reason tells us about the physical world, about the universe and what's in it, okay? Reason helps us understand what is going on around us, but faith helps to lead us to the understanding that there is something deeper or something beyond the natural world, what we would call the supernatural, okay? And it wasn't like the philosophers didn't understand that. The philosophers got there too, okay? I have another question. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like a timeline then. So the Father first, the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. As in a sense of procession from one another, yes, but not in time not what we would understand as chronological time. There's a difference in God, okay? God is not bound by time. God makes time for us the to Holy experience Spirit, time. The Spirit, there, is the, there is the procession that the Father, right, proceeds from nothing, right? right? He is the unmoved mover, okay? But the Son proceeds from the Father. Right? And from the Father and the Son proceed the Holy Spirit. But we can't think about it as chronological time because God exists outside of time. It is a procession, but it is not one that is a procession of time. Okay? So that's what we would call, and when we make a timeline, and sort of what we're doing here, we go back, oh, 400 BC. Here, we're looking at this. We make a timeline. And we say there's all these, these points. And that's chronological time. Chronos is the Greek word for time, right? Logical means ordered, okay? So this is the way that time is ordered. 
one thing and then another and then another so that there is a past, a present, and a future. And time always moves in this direction, flows in, in one direction. All right? That's chronological time. But God is in what we call kairos, outside of time. He is not bound by chronological time because he is omnipresent, present at all times, right? <laughs> and we may say, well, how, how do we understand that or, or what's a, a way to understand that? And when I was teaching the, the children, I used to say, well, think about your favorite movie. You know how the movie begins and you know what happens in the movie, and you know how it ends, okay? But you can think about any part of that movie you want at any time, okay? You're not bound to having to watch that movie unfold to say, well, this is the beginning, and this is the middle, and this is the end, and in order for me ever to think about it, I have to think about the beginning first, and then the middle, and then the end. You can think about the end like that, all right? You can think about any point in the movie, any scene in the movie, like that. Now imagine it's not just one movie, it is all of creation, okay? All of creation is present to God. We say that God is omnipresent. That's looking at it from the perspective of God is everywhere at all times, okay? But instead, it's really, you can look at it the other way, everywhere and all times, are present to God <laughs> immediately. Okay? If that's an image that helps you make sense of that a little bit. Okay? So, God is not bound by chronological time. He gives us time. He sets the universe in motion and he creates time. Because time and space... Right, go together. In fact, this is what we learn from cosmology. There is what we call space-time. Time and space are not really two different things, but time and space are a measurement of the same thing. Your relative space or where you are in the universe affects time or how you perceive time, our perception of time. That's Einstein's theory of relativity. Okay? <laughs> So, but it's interesting that the things that we've learned from faith are that we know from faith from thousands of years ago, right? Become proven by science over time. Science comes to the same conclusions, or philosophy comes to the same conclusions in one sense of understanding, but it is a limited sense because it is a physical sense, a natural sense. And that's what reason does, and that's what philosophy does, and that's what science does. It looks at the natural world, it looks at the physical world, it looks at the things around us. But it can't go beyond those things. It can lead us to faith, right? It can say it's reasonable to believe that there is something beyond this. But we can't say anything about what's beyond this. Not really. Okay? That's the realm of faith. Faith is that step beyond the natural to the supernatural. Beyond the physical to what Aristotle would call the metaphysical. Right? He wrote a book, his, one of his most famous books was The Physics on Physics, the Physical Universe. Right? But he also wrote a book called Metaphysics, okay? which literally just means after physics. What comes after physics? What is beyond the physical world? Okay? And we'll look at that. How Socrates and Plato uh, I don't want to lay this out. Looked at what we would call reality or the natural world and looked at beyond reality or the supernatural world, right? The physical world or the metaphysical world, okay? 
this is where we get into the philosophical ideas that Socrates posited. Have you ever heard of the story of the cave, the allegory of the cave? <laughs> okay. He said, Socrates said, there is an existence like a man chained to a wall. Okay. And all he can see is what is directly in front of him. And there is a fire, right? He can't see the fire, but it's down like in a pit. And there are things that pass in between the fire and the back of the wall of the cave where the light of the fire shines. And so he sees shadows going back and forth. And that's his entire reality. That is what he perceives. And so to him, that is reality, right? The world of shadows. That's the only existence that he knows. That's all that he sees. But then one day, the prisoner is freed, no longer chained to the wall. He stumbles out of the cave into the sunlight. And he sees what we would call the physical world, right? The, what we would call the real world. And he realizes that there are real things that cast these shadows on the wall. And so what is real is not the shadow, but the thing. Okay? And we can say, okay, I can understand that. We understand how, you know, you can see a shadow of something and you can identify it. And you can even give certain properties to it. But it's much different than actually touching the thing, than the thing itself. The shadow is not the reality. The thing itself is what we would call real. But then Socrates says, well, we need to go farther than that. He says, we need to realize that what we call the real world is really only a world of shadows. That there is something that is more real in this world. There is something beyond this world. Okay? So, and he would call that the realm of ideas. the idea. Because in the real world, we look at this and we say, this is a table. Okay? I can touch it, I can feel it. It's a table. But what makes it a table? What is the idea of tableness? It's not the physical thing. I mean, it's made. this one is made out of plastic. A table could be made out of wood. It could be made out of metal. So it can't be the material that makes it a table. Okay, so what makes it a table? The aesthetic, the function, the use, okay? The idea of what a table is. Because we can have an idea of a table in our mind, and it's not any particular example of a table. But we have an idea of what a table is. And he would say that idea, that is what is real. The idea or the ideal. That there is an ideal world. And what we live in is a material world because the material world will break down, right? One day this table will be thrown into a landfill and it will decompose and it will break down. So it cannot be the most real thing because it experiences corruption, decay, okay? Again, if you go back to cosmology, and you look at this at a universal level, it's what we call the idea of entropy. Everything breaks down. Everything disintegrates. Order, right, tends toward chaos. 
okay? We don't, see, we don't see it the other way around. We don't see chaos tending toward order. We don't see everything getting more ordered, more organized, more, no. Go into your child's room, right? No matter how many times they clean it, it always goes from order to chaos, right? In chronological time. All right, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> so I think that we're going to stop there for today, okay? I will pick up with Plato and Aristotle, and we'll, we'll sort of look at the philosophers a little bit more. And we're going to talk about, so I'll just give you a little heads up, we're going to talk about matter and form, okay? Matter, what I was kind of alluding to earlier, like material things, okay? And form... All right, or the world of ideas. We're going to look at that with Plato. Okay. So, and we'll see why this is important because it's going to be important when we come back and talk about the sacraments because every sacrament has matter and form. Okay. All right. Final questions? Well, I had a question. Did you learn all this in your religion classes? Or did you learn <laughs> this in the seminary? <laughs> I did not go to Catholic school right. until I went to the seminary. So, <laughs> but I had studied philosophy before I went to the seminary. Even in college, I had studied philosophy. And so it was a great thing because the first two years at seminary are concentrated on philosophy. We have to have that philosophical underpinning so that we understand our faith. Because when the faith is first written, as far as we're talking about the New Testament, right, and, and Jesus, I'm not talking about the, the Old Testament, but I'm talking about the reason that this is so important is to understand what Jesus is teaching and what the church that he founds is teaching and how the faith is taught. It is expressed because it comes out of a world, when we look historically, that is Hellenistic, right? Rome is in charge, but Rome has not been around so long that they have replaced the previous power of the world, which was Greece. And it is Greek art, Greek thought, Greek philosophy, and the Greek language that are the unifiers of the known world at that time, okay? And these philosophical ideas are part of the education of anyone who is educated at that time. And they're educated in Greek and they speak Greek. And so the early documents of the church, the New Testament itself is written in Greek but also the early documents of the councils of the church explaining the faith are written in Greek and use these Greek philosophical ideas. And so if we don't understand that, if we don't have the underpinning to understand what that is, we don't understand what the faith is that the early church was recording and teaching and saying, this is what we believe. When we say we believe about the Eucharist in transubstantiation, what does that word mean? What do we mean? We believe in transubstantiation. That's the teaching. That's the doctrine of the church. What does it mean? Well, we'll see that next time, too, when we look at Aristotle. Substance and accidents. Okay? So that's for next time. All right? <laughs> <laughs> to answer my question is if you was I was schooled in Catholic schools from kindergarten through and so was my husband Jim. Mm -hmm. We were not we were taught philosophy bits of it. We were taught faith more, you know, Bible. You should have been taught Latin. <laughs> Latin. Okay. But we didn't get all of this. Yeah. So 
But this is just a way of, because I was a teacher before I went to the seminary, I was a teacher, and I enjoy teaching. And I also am kind of a big picture person, and so I like to draw all these things together and kind of see how it fits together in the big picture. Yeah. But then other teachers, you know, didn't do it. But so yeah. uh, thankfully it's our children so weird. Yeah. And they believed all of us yeah. believed in another. Yeah. I mean it's nothing new. It's just a matter of looking at what's there and trying to put put the pieces together and get a picture in your mind of okay, I have a better understanding of the big picture of my faith. And I don't just believe because someone said to believe. I don't just believe this because the Pope said it. And that's not, that's not the way the church wants us to be. The church does not want us to live our faith and just say, well, I believe it because the Pope said it. You know, or I believe it because Father said it. Or, no, we need to have a reason for our belief. And even St. Paul, right, in the scripture says that. Always be prepared to give a reason in defense of your faith. Okay? All right, let's end. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, we thank you for this time together, and we thank you for the gift of reason that you have endowed us with. We hope that it will help us always to lead us deeper to faith in you, to help us to understand and to explore our relationship with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen.